Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we turn now in our My Perspectives volume to the third of our three poems in the Poetry Collection, number one, on page 759 and following. We're now going to study the great Seshlav Misho's A Song on the End of the World. Obviously, in our sixth unit here, we're dealing with topics specific to the end of the world, survival, dysutopian kinds of understandings, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic literature. There are some who argue that Misho's the greatest poet of the 20th century, especially the late 20th century. I'm with you on 759 for some biography information. Notice the dates, 1911 to 2004. Born in Lithuania, before the revolution brought the Soviets to power in 1918. Misho spent the World War II years working for underground presses, then came to the United States as an embassy official for the communist Polish government. In 1951, Misho defected to the United States and began writing books, ultimately receiving the Nobel Prize in 1980. His poetry always then is going to have that powerful symbiotic sense of old world Europe and then of course his American roots as he, as he would then finally defect um, to the United States. Let's get some background information for a song on the end of the world. Warsaw, Poland, circle it. Warsaw, Poland was one of the many cities devastated by the Nazi regime during World War II. For most of the war, the Nazis occupied the city. Polish Jews were rounded up in ghettos, sent to concentration camps, and tragically, of course we know, executed. In 1944, the Polish Home Army staged an uprising against the Nazis. Civilian casualties were in hundreds of thousands. The Nazis eventually overcame the uprising and went on to destroy much of the city. Now, the power of reading a poem like A Song on the End of the World is that this is a poem that is going to work not only looking forwards, but as well looking backwards to a horrific time when Michaud and the Polish people had to deal with absolute insanity of the Nazis. Notice the power of nature in this poem, as so often is the case in Michaud's poems. And we've given lectures on other uh, Cecilov Michaud poems uh, at learnstrong.net. Let's just read the poem and then we'll exegete. On the day the world ends, a bee circles a clover, a fisherman mends a glimmering net, happy porpoises jump in the sea, by the rain spout young sparrows are playing, and the snake is gold skinned as it should always be. On the day the world ends, women walk through the fields under their umbrellas. A drunkard grows sleepily at the edge of the lawn. Vegetable peddlers shout in the street, and a yellow-sailed boat comes nearer the island. The voice of a violin lasts in the air and leads into a starry night. And those who expected lightning and thunder are disappointed. And those who expected signs and archangels trumps do not believe it is happening now. As long as the sun and the moon are above, as long as the bumblebee visits a rose, as long as rosy infants are born, no one believes it is happening now. Only a white-haired old man, who would be a prophet, yet is not a prophet, for he's much too busy repeats while he binds his tomatoes. There will be no other end of the world. There will be no other end of the world. And then Misha will say at the bottom of the poem, Warsaw 1944. Now let's say three things really quickly about this poem for your notes. The first, of course, is the compelling idea that the end of the world will not end, as we have said before in T.S. Eliot's famous Hollow Man, not with a bang but a whimper. Here it will go unnoticed, the end of the world. That is to say, worlds are destroyed all the time, and no one seems to know at all. We will get to the old man who should be a prophet, but he's not a prophet. And this poem begs the question so often rendered by this poem, the question, why is it that we so regularly don't listen to prophets until after the fact, when it's obviously too late, and then we go, oh yeah, 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 the prophet was right after all. Notice in the first stanza, we've got bees, we've got fishermen, we've got happy porpoises. In other words, life, when the world ends, 
will be the way it always has been, where the animals of the world are simply doing what animals do, and the fishermen of the world are doing what fishermen do. And then in the second stanza, women walking under umbrellas through fields, a drunkard, a vegetable peddler, a sailboat, the violin playing. And then in the third stanza, the people who expected the world to end with lightning and thunder are disappointed, we might say, shocked, right? And the people who were religiously looking for the end of the world, they don't believe that in fact this is the way the world ends. And then notice the repetition in line 17, uh, eight, I'm sorry, 18, 19, and 20. Notice the repetition of as long as, as long as, as long as the sun and the moon are above, as long as the bumblebee visits a rose, we're back to the second line with the bumblebee, as long as rosy infants are born, no one believes it's happening now. In other words, the future is now. The end of the world is always happening, as the beginning of the world with rosy infants is always happening. But then we get to the white-haired old man, and obviously many have said in his latter years, Misha became somewhat like this white-haired old man who was the amazing poetic prophet at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century. He would be a prophet, but isn't a prophet. He's too busy, in other words. He, he's going about the things that's called your life, your living. He will repeat while he binds his tomatoes. Notice he's growing things, right? That... There is no other end of the world. This is the only end of the world. As the breath that you're taking right now will soon come to its end, and then there will be another one. Notice we're working again symbolically with these ideas of circles, of cycles, right? At 3A, how does this poem work with the previous two poems that we've studied just recently now? Sherman Alexie's The Powell at the End of the World and Lucille Clifton's The Beginning of the End of the World. How do those how do those two poems work with this poem? And what is it that all three of these poems are saying about the end of the world? And in Unit 6, this notion of survival. And then finally, at 3B, in what ways do you understand that this is the way the world ends? It's all about the cycles. It's all about the very breath that you're taking right now. To what degree have you experienced many ends of the world and then many new beginnings of the world? It's a powerful set of lines that I hope will lead you to more of the great work of Seshlov Misha.